Hey there, I'm Sonny Sadu and welcome to Alberta. You know, when most people mention Alberta, you're thinking Rocky Mountains, rolling foothills, and wide open prairies. In fact, Alberta was once known as the Wild West that was settled by a bunch of pioneers that may have looked like this. In fact, they kind of sort of did look like that because we had a picture of it. But how many of you actually know that some of the earliest pioneers in the early 1900s in Alberta were actually guys who sort of looked like this? or maybe even like me. Well, we're here to tell the story about some of the earliest Punjabi pioneers who settled in Alberta even before Alberta even became a province. I had no idea. You probably had no idea. So why don't you come with me and we'll tell the stories of some of the earliest Punjabi pioneers of Alberta. Our journey actually begins here in Edmonton, Alberta at this relatively unassuming park here in Mill Woods, the Zoen Singh Bular Park. Bueller Park? The Zoen Singh Baller Park. Nah, it's Buller. Buller? Yeah. Buller? Yeah. And who are you? This is my park. You're Zoen Singh Buller? No, it's my great uncle. My name is Ranbir Buller. Ranbir Buller of the great so and sing Bullers. Yeah. If this is your great uncle, how did he get a park named after him? That's a good question. And what would possess a guy from Punjab, one of the most tropical places on earth, to move to this place? So what do you know about him? Well, I know he was one of the first Punjabis to immigrate in Edmonton. Settled here, and he helped others settle here as well. That's about it. <sighs> Millennials, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. Why don't you come with me? go on a little magical Bill and Ted's kind of journey, and I'll teach you more about your great uncle. Sure. Let's go. Parks get named by committees. So how did your great uncle's name come up? You know what? I actually know somebody at the city of Edmonton. This is pretty cool. You mentioned the gentleman who petitioned to have the park named after him. And this is the actual document. That's that's it. Cop, sorry, the photocopied official document. <laughs> yeah. uh, the process where uh, Donahue basically rallied to get the park named after Sons and Buller. Now, Donahue was a former police officer, correct? That's right. He was the chief of police. Oh, really? Yeah, be before he retired. Um, so this role, he was in a volunteer capacity. He was just that involved with uh, our our civic politics and he wanted to make sure that you know uh, a lot of different groups of people were were being recognized and, and honored the chairman of the naming committee at the time Samuel Donahue he was very um, assertive about finding these individuals that have impacted Edmonton and Sohan was known within the Indian community as being the go-to guy for especially student immigrants when they would come, uh, especially through an exchange um, at the U of A and coming from India. Sohan Singh Buller helped a lot of students from India. In fact, Punjab prior to 1947 consisted of regions in both India and Pakistan. What does Punjab mean? Well, Punj in the language Punjabi meaning five and Ab meaning river. It was the land of five rivers. Back in the mid-1800s, Punjab was already an established and prosperous region, which was part of the Sikh Empire. Then the colonizing British came along, and naturally, they tried to do what they did around the world. They tried to take over. After 50 years and two Anglo-Sikh wars, Sikh soldiers began joining new British regiments. A lot were conscripted, but some actually volunteered. A group of retired soldiers now part of the British Empire, used this to their advantage, and they caught their first glimpse of Canada in 1897 as Canada began its expansion into the West. Well, Alberta, of course, as you know, has a, a history that goes back thousands of years with uh, indigenous people, but uh, the arrival of people to, uh, from other parts of the world to make this their home started really in the 18th century and then took off in the late 19th century and early 20th century. So that's when you saw the, the incredible rush of people to take up homesteads in the West. And from that, the creation of uh, the railway network and the uh, evolution of the cities that, uh, that we know today. 
Now, for me, it's kind of cool to know that the brown wave didn't just occur in the 60s when Pierre Trudeau opened up the doors to immigration to Canada, or in the 70s and 80s. Punjabis are known to be adventurous people and were taking their chances and heading across the oceans. So Rambeer's great uncle obviously must have joined others. This speaks volumes about the nature of the people from Punjab. In fact, he traveled around a lot. He started from his little village in Sarhali Kalan in the Tharn Tharan district of Punjab, which at that time was still a part of India. Then he made his way to Bombay, which is now known as Mumbai. Then hopped on another boat, ended up in Malaysia. Decided, yeah, probably need to get a 24-hour suit made and stopped over in Hong Kong. Got on another boat and ripped across the ocean and made his way to Victoria. He eventually made his way to Lethbridge and Chisholm. So and Singh Buller eventually settled in Callahoo where he ran a coffee shop. Being the entrepreneur that he was, he then decided he needed a farm in Green Court, White Court. And then he settled in a house near the university in Edmonton after he retired from his farm. His eldest living daughter, Helen Heslip, told us what their life was like before settling in Edmonton. Two children were born in White Court. And then uh, there was a fire. As I understand, they, they lost... Um, their home in a fire, and he just picked, took us, my, my mother and two children, to Victoria, BC, and that's where we lived for the next 10, 12 years, and three more children were born, because there's seven of us, mm -hmm. and we came back to Alberta. He wanted to farm, so the farm is just north and, north and west from here, about, about 60 kilometers. It's not very far, you know, near Marathorpe and Green Court and White Court. So we moved there, and uh, I left home when I was about 17 and came to the city. The war was just over then. Uh, the, uh, just cer soon after that, the uh, Canada started that uh, Alaskan highway because the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Maybe you remember all of that. So, back in the day, how do you suppose other Albertans looked at So and Sing Buller? Play on, player. Oh, barkeep. To your finest libations. Can I get uh, two of those? And you know what? I'm gonna get myself a hot tamale. But, uh, do you know that So and Sing Buller had a very uh, creative uh, lifestyle with certain aspects of maybe manipulating the law? Really? You know what? You gotta check this out. So, so and Sing Buller is actually one of my favorites. He, um, he actually landed in Victoria first and then came to the Lethbridge area in about uh, 1918. He was actually one of the four pioneers that Abraham Singh negotiated that land lease for. So So and Singh was one of the earliest uh, pioneers, one of the earliest farmers. He was also a bit of um, an entrepreneur and liked to um, sort of take advantage of opportunities. I do have um, a couple of newspaper clippings from him where, like so many others, he's charged with jaywalking in Lethbridge. But one of my favorites is he was fined $150 for selling liquor illegally under the auspices of a hot tamale stand. It's just Lomax in there. Willis, get off your duff. Go see what this tamale business is all about. You, you sir, you're uh, under arrest for selling uh, bootleg liquor, and you, oh, hey, Lomax. You know, we'll just give you a ticket for bubble drunkenness. So and Singh Buller married Ephigenia Jones at the Shiloh Baptist Church. Now her family came from Mississippi in 1910. In fact, their youngest daughter, Judy Singh, is a famous Edmonton jazz artist who made her mark on the scene in the 1970s. So we tracked down Judy's daughter, Emily, who's based out of Calgary, and she's been preserving the legacy of her parents. There's a few albums, but this is uh, a very recent reissue, which is exciting. So this is an album that my mom recorded 
with uh, the late Tommy Banks, very well-known uh, jazz pianist. My mum recorded this when I was a baby. After uh, her and my father had split up, she went back to Edmonton where her siblings were for a support system. She was one of seven, and that's when this was recorded. And she was hesitant about recording this album uh, because it's, it's orchestrated, it's difficult arrangements. Tommy encouraged her. She said, I don't think I can do this. And he said, oh, yes, you can. And it's, it's um, kind of a, you know, it's got a cult following. It's, you know, jazz singers look out for it. And, and um, I'm quite proud of it. Interestingly, there was also another person with whom So and Sing Buller worked on that farm in Lethbridge, a fellow by the name of Sam Singh. Sam Singh also married an African-American woman um, by the name of uh, Elma Mae Stoner. Both So and Singh and Sam Singh, along with their wives, eventually moved to Edmonton and settled in Edmonton. You are tuned to CKUA. That's been around since its humble beginnings in 1927 at the University of Alberta campus to our current 16 FM transmitters across the fair province of Alberta. And this is Mid-Morning Mojo. My name is Bob. CKUA Radio used to be run out of the U of A campus and aired interviews in the day of a few prominent Punjabi students. Like Sadhu Singh Dami, a novelist who married a woman in Montreal and settled in Switzerland. Among the campus gateway newspaper writers were Hazara Singh Garcha, an agricultural student and regular columnist. These guys did not like working in lumber mills. And then there was Darshan Singh Sangha. He even changed his name to Darshan Singh Canadian. That's how much he loved Canada. He was extremely successful in leading the fight for voting rights and citizenship for undocumented Indians who settled here. He was also a trade union activist and a communist organizer, both here and in India. Now let me share another story about a pioneer who settled in Calgary, a true pioneer legend, Harnam Singh Harry. His work ethic and perseverance made his dreams of success come to fruition. Harnam Singh Harry was actually one of the first livestock sponsors of the Calgary Stampede in 1912, and at one point he was the largest landowner in Calgary, owning everything from the Chinook Center north. So in 1908, Harnam Singh Harry decided this was the year for his giant worldwide adventure. He was in India, stationed in Burma, went back to India, basically told his wife that he'd be off to buy some cows at the next village, never came back. In fact, he sailed off to Hong Kong and then eventually to San Francisco, where he met Inspector William Hopkinson. All right, then I've got room for force of passage to Canada. Uh, what about me? All right, then, let's go, number five. And this is where the story gets interesting. After traveling from San Francisco to Victoria by pleading his case to come into Canada, Arnaud Singh Harry rode the rails to Alberta. It was just outside of Banff that rail officials kicked him off the train. He was stranded with no money. He decided he was going to walk to Calgary. On his way, he stopped in Eksha at a cement factory and negotiated his way into a job with the local boss by doing the work equivalent of four men in the fraction of the time. So from there, they paid him 10 cents an hour, saved his money, and then he made his way into Calgary. So 20 years later, the wife he left behind, Kem Kaur, ended up joining Harnam Singh Harry in Canada. Kem Kaur jumped right in. She ended up driving the family milk truck around to all the deliveries. So check this out. I had a chance to sit down with Harnam Singh Harry's great-granddaughter, Arpan Harry, who's actually a fourth-generation Alberta rancher. I love horses and I love the Western lifestyle, and I guess that's something he's passed down to us, and he liked, you know, cattle and horses, and I and my family like rodeo and wagons. We're big supporters of the Calgary Stampede. Now, Harry was befriended and helped along the way by a number of people, including a local auctioneer who dubbed him the Indian Emperor. Well, from what I heard from my family members was that he liked business and he liked going to auctions, buying and selling, you know, pigs and horses. And so his first farm was actually a hog farm and he would buy a lot of hogs and sell them and then buy some land. So he would go on, I heard, like weekly to the auction market. One thing about him was he was very modest and even though he had so much land, 
He was a great humanitarian, and I think that's why a lot of people respected him a lot. And even in the Great Depression, you know, he had a hog farm, and my family were doing okay because we were farmers, right? But he would always give um, hogs for free to people who didn't have any food to eat, so he was very charitable, and I think that resonates with me and my family because he was a rich man. He was a good businessman, but you'd never know it. Arnam Singh Harry also had a park on his former land named in his honour. His nonagenarian grandson shared their family honour during the park's grand opening. I really honour you know, to have the park named after him, you see. And uh, I, I can't thank everybody you know, that had anything to do to making this park uh, under his name. Now the women from Punjab who managed to get into Canada in the early 1900s, they didn't have it easy. There was a lot of political and social pressure to keep them out and prevent them from getting permanent residency. But the most hardcore of them who managed to stay in Canada, they became very established, not only by having successful families, successful public lives, but also working their way up political ladders as well. There's two really early ones. One of them is um, Sujang Kaur um, Hari, who actually married into the Hari family. The um, other is a woman by the name of Dang Kaur. And Dang Kaur was married to actually one of the earliest arrivals in the Crow's Nest, Nest Pass, a fellow by the name of Barama Singh. And Bayrama Singh had come to the Crow's Nest Pass. He worked in a mill. He came as early as probably 1906. But then in 1920, he returned back to Punjab and he brought his wife, Dang Kaur, with him. And the two settled in Pincher Creek, where they owned a, uh, where they owned a farm. And Dang Kaur was known for um, being very strong-willed very independent, very entrepreneurial. She worked the farm, she milked um, cows, she made butter, she cut it into cakes, she sold it. When they moved to Calgary later on, um, she actually built her own house with the money that she had earned selling eggs and um, farm products from their, um, from their farm here in, uh, in, in Calgary. Her home was actually one of the centers for new Punjabi migrants to come. I remember speaking with a number of Punjabi migrants who came in the 50s and 60s, and they would come to Calgary with just Dunkor's phone number written on a slip of paper. And they'd arrive at the Greyhound station, and all they did is just call this number. They didn't know who it belonged to. She would send a car, they would come pick, pick the person up, and they'd be fed. Um, she was a person, Dunkor was a person who was actually one of the very first to have the Guru Granth Sahib in the home. So she was devoutly religious. She worked hard. She shared her earnings, right? The, the, the hallmarks of sort of, a sort of sick life. So, so she is absolutely remarkable. Her husband, uh, Bairama Singh, was a little bit of a cowboy, if I can put it that way. He was a wrestler, he loved horses, he was as tough as nails. There is a um, article in the Lethbridge Herald that tells the story of Bairama Singh's house getting robbed at gunpoint. And the robbers came, the thieves came, and Bairama Singh said, just a moment, and instead of going to get his wallet, he went and got his shotgun off the kitchen table, and the uh, thieves, would-be thieves, took off. So they, 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 were, they were really both quite strong personalities, but of course, women played a huge role and very often they are unsung and their contributions go unnoticed. And then there's the Honorable Leela here. She's a successful politician who happens to be married into a pioneer Punjabi family. And this speaks volumes of how Punjabis and their hard work has elevated their positions in today's society. On my in-law's side, um, they're Punjabi. Um, they're attached to the earth, completely attached to the earth. My father-in-law had a very, very difficult upbringing um, and was sold into slavery at the age of six by his family. My mother-in-law's uh, father um, saw good in him and betrothed them, and he came to Canada first, and then she followed and ended up with one of the most beautiful human beings that has ever graced this earth. He's a magnificent man. Um, he's taught me so much about resilience and forgiveness and love. It took some detective work to uncover the stories of Punjabi pioneers. Fortunately for Rambir, 
his family has this park. Did you learn anything about your great uncle? Yeah, it was uh, pretty interesting. I've always wanted to learn more, and uh, it was nice to learn about that family in Calgary, too. I mean, there's a lot of pioneering stories that happen. I mean, this hopefully gets you a little more connected to exactly who your great uncle was. So we've told the story of only a few of the original pioneers of Alberta. There's hundreds more. If you're a second or third generation settler, there's a good chance your ancestor is a pioneer, and maybe even a Punjabi pioneer. If you have a story to share, get in touch with us.